Good morning. Welcome to Fairport Christian Fellowship. How's everybody doing today? Good, brother. All right. Hey, uh, you probably noticed that Dee's not here. Um, she just texted me 10 minutes ago. She said, thinking about you, having have a blessed service and say hello to everyone from me. Hi, <laughs> I said, K. <"Kay." laughs> and she sent a little, what do they call those faces? <laughs> Laughing with tears, you know. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to open up the service today. Our opening scripture is found in Psalm 145, verses 8 through 10. But before I say that, I'm gonna, there's a, a verse that I gave to you last Sunday that I said, hey, you know, it would be really good for you to commit this to memory, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start that out with this. It's not going to be on the wall. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. And that's the Lord speaking. So I just hope you you take that and you remember that. The Lord sees that you've showed up here today. In, In the very fact that you walk in the door and then you take a seat in his house, you're setting your love upon him. You're setting your affections upon things, uh, 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 the things of God and the things above. And because you do that, he promises, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set you on high. I want you to hold on to that, okay? But our opening verses, Psalm 145, verses 8 through 10. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all. And his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. So let the saints bless the Lord today, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that uh, we're in your house, and we have set our, our love upon you today, and we thank you for your goodness to us. And I do pray that you would make your goodness pass before us this very day. As these scriptures tell us that you're merciful, kind, and gracious, we thank you for that. And I do pray that as we think about that, Lord God, it would just cause us to lift our hearts in praise to you because you are worthy. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're able, you can stand with me me as we worship, okay?
Savior leads me. Who am I to ask beside? How could I doubt His tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? All the way my Savior leads me. She each winding path I tread. Gives me grace for every trial. Feeds me with the living bread. You lead me and keep me from falling. You carry me close to your heart. And surely your goodness and mercy will follow me. All the way my Savior leads me. Oh, the fullness of His love. Oh, the sureness of His thankful we are that you do lead us, Lord, that you have not left us alone, Lord. And I do pray, Father God, that as we've come today, Lord, that we would just lay our hearts before you, Lord, that we would open ourselves to hear what you would say to us and lead us in a way that's everlasting, Lord. Many things around us perish, Lord, but you never perish and your people will never perish. And I thank you for that, Lord. I pray for pastor today that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit. Bring forth the bread, Lord, so that we can partake of who you are. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I guess you already know that, don't you? <laughs> I appreciate that prayer for the Holy Spirit. Uh, but I got to ask you a question first today. Are you hungry? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, are you hungry? Yeah. Hungry? What, what are you hungry for? I'm hungry for to eat. <laughs> now, I say that, okay, the scripture tells us, and I gave you the scripture last week in Acts chapter 2, the description of a very thrive, thriving and alive and kicking church. And uh, part of that description is that they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart 
praising God and having favor with all the people. So right there it is. They ate their food with gladness. And I, do, I give you that scripture as an introduction and a reminder that we're having a feast next Sunday after church. Right after church, we'll take down the chairs, put up the tables, and we'll have a feast. You want to sign up back over there to bring something for me to eat? That's great, <laughs> you know. Uh, so we eat, you know. And I also want to invite you to, uh, if you have a song to sing, uh, I already have one volunteer that wants to play his trombone. He's going to play for us Amazing Grace. And um, if you have a, a something you'd like to share, a testimony, it's good if you share a testimony. We can all be encouraged by what the Lord is doing in your life. So it's it's good that you didn't, don't hear it just from me all the time. If you've got something that the Lord has done, uh, don't be afraid to come and, and we'll give you that opportunity. Um, you know, uh, I also mentioned to you that John, John Marsh, our assistant pastor down in Florida now, he sent me a verse this morning. I figure I want to give it to you. It's from Jeremiah 31, 25. It says, For I have satiated the weary, soul and i have replenished every sorrowful soul that's god speaking he has fully satisfied the weary soul so we were just talking about having food to eat and our appetites but the lord wants to satisfy our spiritual appetites and so i ask you again today are you hungry <laughs> not just for regular food but soul food and I pray that the Lord, I, that's why I appreciate Pastor John's prayer there for me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I pray also that you would be filled with the Holy Spirit today in this place, that he would be able to open your ears to hear what he has to say to you. He's got a message here, and he's going to speak it. But, you know, I've learned some things about the Lord over my 40 years with him. He can take something and say something to you that I wasn't even thinking of, you know, and I, I know that that's the Spirit of God. You know, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And the words that he speaks to us are words of life today, and they give us life. But there's only one way for that to happen. The Holy Spirit brings it to us. So let's pray that way right now father we thank you we thank you for your word lord because it gives us nourishment in our soul and you satisfy us with it lord and i do pray that every soul that is here today maybe some are weary that you would satisfy their weary soul today it cannot be satisfied with anything else but the word of God brought forth by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I pray, Holy Spirit, not just me, but everybody here, open our ears that we may be able to hear instruction from your word. And we pray this today in Jesus' name, amen. You can turn in your Bibles now to Genesis chapter 5. In case you don't know where Genesis is, it's the first book of the Bible, and we've made it all the way to chapter 5, and I have named this message Old Timers, and you're probably going to see why it's called Old Timers. I have gotten the privilege of knowing some old timers in my life, in the job that I did at RG&E. Uh, going to people's houses, I met t people in their 90s. Oh, I remember one lady was 85 years old. She's out in the back cutting her lawn with one of those old rotary lawnmowers. She was in good health. Uh, I've met people in, in, in their 90s. I met a few people, a handful of people, that were 100. Imagine that, 100 years old. I mean, it would be something to see somebody make it to 100 years old, oh, back in the year 1000, right? But how much change would they have seen in their lives? 
from 1,000 to 1,100. Probably not much. Still riding around on a horse. But over this past century, if you think about it, <clears throat> these people that have made it 100 years have seen the most changes ever. When they were born, and I remember talking to this one guy down in the South Wedge, and he, he said, man, yeah, I've lived in this house my whole entire life since I was a child. And I said, I bet you when you were out here in the street, if there was a street, it was more like a path with, for horses, right? And a few cars might go by. You'd be, all your buddies would stop and go, look, a car. Or look up into the air and see, look, a plane. It would be something to, for us. We don't even think about it. But think of the changes that that generation has seen. It has increased exponentially for them. And so I just love talking with those people that are in their 90s and 100s because they have seen so many things. And they can describe. I remember years ago in my first church, I was a young man. I was in my 20s. I loved sitting next to this one guy who was 80-something. He had been in World War I, and he was a, a cook. In World War One, he said, "I I was born in Brighton, and we we didn't have anything. If we wanted to play football, somebody got an old rag and taped it with tape, and that's that was our ball. You know, they have so, such great testimonies, and it helps us to think about these things. And that's what we're gonna see right here." in this very first verse, all right? It says in verse 1, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. You remember that, that he, God created Adam and he was in God's image. Mankind is made in God's image. But it's interesting here that it says it, it, this is a book of the genealogy. That, that kind of tells us that there is reading, and there is writing. We some, sometimes get the sense that the, these people back then were like cavemen, oh, you know, who, with a big stick or whatever. No, I believe that they were using much of their intelligence that we don't use. And I do believe that Adam may have been writing this. And as each son is born, is passed down, and they add their point part to it, it, it gets to Moses. Some people might say, well, you know, I think that God spoke to Moses and gave him this. And that could be true. We don't really know. But I just wanted to point out that it says a book of the genealogy of Adam. It makes sense to me that you would write down, okay, this is how it happened. And Adam would write that down. And then he would tell his son, now you write down your, your paragraph. And we got to carry it on down. And how far can you go with this genealogy? I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to take you to Noah today. From Noah, we can go to Shem. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah. Anyways. And then you can go to Matthew chapter 1, and you can follow ge the genealogy all the way to who? Jesus Christ. And that's why this is very important. Now, who wrote it? Did Adam write it? Did Moses write it down because it was handed to him? Or did God give it to him? One way or the other, we believe this, don't we? It's rich, written in the scriptures, right? And we know, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So bottom line, this is written for our instruction by God so that we can gain from it and we are going to learn a few things from this there's going to be a message in here for you today i know there's a few things that the lord wanted to point out but i had to uh you know i was thinking of my ancestors now my ancestors settled sterling valley you, gary you know where that is right yeah it's out there by you pasotis my ancestors pierre dumas he rode with Lafayette, and he settled that area 1700s, late 1700s, okay? 
Well, it says that he, I have a history of him. He, he died in 1825 after he settled this valley. But his, his wife, Mary, doesn't tell us when she died. I'm pretty sure she's not around. She's got to be my great, 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 great grandmother. Maybe eight greats in there, maybe seven. I don't really know. Uh, but they've, the Damas family has kept all of this genealogy, you know. We can trace it all the way back. But I needed to share with you because she's got a message for us today, just like these guys have a message. On her gravestone, imagine this. This is what she felt was important to put on her gravestone. My children dear, I pray draw near and listen while I tell. Without free grace, your dwelling place will be a burning hell. <laughs> she was concerned for her children. And you know, you can go to the cemetery today and read that message. A couple hundred years old. Just like we're reading today. A message that goes through all of time. I'm glad that she mentioned grace. Okay? Because it didn't really sound very gracious, did it? But she's saying, if you don't choose grace, my children, your, your dwelling place, Truth is, it's going to be burning hell. That's what she felt was important to put on her gravestone. And I think it's a great message. But let's go on. In verse 2, I'm going to read 2 to 5. He created them male and female, blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years. Wow. <laughs> And begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Now, you should be amazed, right? I'm, I'm sure you're thinking of it, okay? He lived 130 years and begot another son. He already had sons and daughters. We've already read that. But he had another son. And this is the important one because this is the line of Jesus, okay? But I know that you're thinking, wow, 930 years. And we're going to see this throughout this chapter, These, what, what, what we call antediluvians. That's the name for it, people who lived before the flood. Okay, they were antediluvian. And they had long ages. I'll deal with that at the end if I get there, okay? But I wanted to point out to you that the last thing I read was, and he died. Adam died. Why did he die? Because of sin. And Jesus, God had said to him, if you eat of that tree, in that day, you will surely die. But he didn't die that day, did he? According to our time. Well, we're going to see. But I wanted to point out, and he died, because that's what we're going to read eight times throughout this chapter. We see something that happens. Every single one of these men die. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment. So, Adam died. Was that the end? It says, after this, the judgment. Point is, there's something after death. And people are not preparing themselves for that eventuality you guys are prepared right are you how do you prepare yourself trusting in jesus christ that's the bottom line but the scriptures say it's appointed for men to die once after this the judgment i just had to as i was reading this in my bible this week 
Go on to the next verse, Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. <laughs> there it is. There it is. How do you avoid death or the judgment? Jesus Christ. He's the only way. And I love this. It says, to those who eagerly wait for him. Is that you? Are you eagerly waiting? I'm always trying to point to you. Get, look up. Okay, try to forget about all the things that are going on in your world and this world. I know they're bothersome. But so the, the answer to, for you is to look up. Look up and to eagerly wait for him. He promised he's coming back, right? And I have to ask you, do you believe that? I mean, we believe that he died for our sins. We believe that he was resurrected. We believe that he was ascended. Do you believe what the angels said to the, the apostles that on that day when he ascended? Hey, why are you looking up into heaven? You know, he's going to come back the same way. Okay, he's going to come back. And that's what the Bible says. And lest you think that Pastor Dan's crazy. It says, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear, come on, finish it, a second time, apart from sin for salvation. Man, that's a great verse. You know, maybe you just needed to hear that today, to get your eyes redirected into the right place. But the point is here, we're going to read eight times, and he died. Because it's appointed for men to die once. <clears throat> on to verse 6, it says, Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he Come on, join in with me. And he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. After he begot Mahalalel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Mahalalel lived 65 years and begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalalel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years. He didn't even make it to 900. And he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and he, he didn't die. <laughs> he didn't die. It says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. You know, this is a great little picture. And I guess I could go into a big study on the rapture of the church, but we're not going to do that today. He's, it's just there to show us. Because in this chapter, we're dealing with eight times, and he died. But here, the Lord gives us a little bit of hope. It's, it's the blessed hope, isn't it? That's what Titus tells us. I think it's chapter 2, verse 10. The rapture is the blessed hope. We need to have that hope. And I'm just pointing you that and today, and Enoch is a picture of that for us to see today. Enoch walk, walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. First of all, walking with God. How many times are we encouraged to walk with God? 
Can you walk with God? I know that he said it to Abram. I think it's in Genesis 15 or 17. Either one of those two. He walked with God. He said, walk before me. I am the Lord God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And so he wants to have a walk with us. He wants ju just to walk with Enoch, just to walk with Abraham, just to walk with Moses, just to walk with David. No, he wants to walk with every single one of us. He knows your name. He knows who you are. And his heart's yearning is just to have a relationship walking with him. Is it possible to walk with God? Obviously it is because Enoch shows us. And it's a good reminder. What are some of the things that we hear in the scriptures? I believe it's in Galatians. Walk in the spirit and you will not carry out the deeds of the flesh. Jesus tells us to walk in the light. John reminds us that in 1 John. To walk in the light as he is in the light. And we will have fellowship. We are to walk in agreement with God. In the Old Testament, it tells us, I believe it's in Micah. To walk in agreement and to walk together. How can they walk together unless they be in agreement? We are to walk circumspectly. What does that mean? On a tightrope. Yeah, well, how would you walk on a tightrope anyhow? Very carefully, yes. Well, our walk in this world is supposed to be that way because the ways of the world are contrary to our walk with God. The ways of the world, most of the world is going a certain direction. It's away from God. We're trying to walk with God. Therefore, as we walk with him, we're being jostled by the rest of the world. You know, We have to be aware of things going on around us, temptations, darkness, all kinds of things. Well, there's a an awareness of a roaring lion who wants to what? Devour. So our walk, it, it means to walk is to have a relationship not once a week. Yeah, ladies, how many of you want to be married to a guy for an hour a week? I hear that back there. No, it's 24-7. It's every day. That's what the walk means. We have a relationship that begins, uh, let's kind of say it early in the morning when you wake up, first thing, thinking about the Lord, thinking about his scriptures, spending time with him, thinking about him throughout the day. No matter how busy your day may be, we all have work to do, bills to pay, things to do. But the Lord can be with you in all those things. That's a relationship. That's a walk. Didn't we just sing that, you know, all the way my Savior leads me? Where does that, does that remind you of any scripture? How about Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He lays me down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his own name. At the end of it, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That was the song, wasn't it? He leads us. He wants to have a walk. And Enoch is an example of that. When you hear that Enoch walked with God, he had a, he had a relationship with him. So much so that he could hear. And I'm going to show a scripture to you in a few seconds. That says that he did hear and see things that the Lord was showing him because he had a walk. He'll do the same thing for you. Part of his walk, it says, well, why, why did it, was it pleasing to God? Why did God say, I'm going to take him? In Hebrews 11, 5, on the wall, it says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony 
that he pleased God. What pleases God? Faith. Faith in him. That was his testimony. That's what Hebrews tells us. By faith, Enoch was taken. He pleased God. And it says he did not see death. I, I was looking at this verse again this morning before I came in, and it just reminded me, this is not going to be on the wall, so this is just free. John 5.24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Passed out of death. Will not see death. You'll see life. Your faith, it's by faith. Enoch is an example to us right in the midst of a world. His, his world around him was, for the most part, turning away from God. Our world's not like that, is that? Yeah. If our world was <coughs> walking with the Lord today, there wouldn't be an empty chair here. And there wouldn't be any empty pews down in the church in Fairport or any of the churches that are preaching his word. They would be full. But you're here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's by faith. And Hebrews 11.6, the very next verse says it. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. When you ask the Lord, hey, how can I please you today? He's going to say, just believe me. Just trust me. By faith, without, w- without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, he is God, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you don't know that verse, you should write it down. Memorize it, put it on the bathroom mirror, whatever, dashboard, and remember, believe God, have faith in him. I'll ask you again, you believe he's coming back? You mean I'm not the only crazy one here? (laughs) Well, thanks, brother. I've been crazy for a long time. You can't walk with God like Enoch did, apart from having faith and believing him. You must believe that he is. Well, the book of Jude, it's got one chapter. It also tells us a little bit about Enoch. It tells us that God thinks he's a prophet because he prophesies something. And Jude tells us that. In verse 14, it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying who who are these men if the world around him that is going away from God he can see what's happening it vexes his soul daily kind of like lot and sometimes your soul can be vexed by things that are going on you got to keep your eyes on the lord but enoch prophesies about his world back then it says Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. We just read this yesterday at the men's breakfast here, didn't we? And Jesus is coming back. Who's coming with him? Yes. Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Enoch is looking all the way to the return of Jesus Christ. He can see. That's, I guess he's got to walk with God. He can hear, he can see something. God's showing him something. Hey, Enoch, check this out. Maybe he gave him the picture of Jesus riding on a white horse with a robe dipped in blood. It says he is the word of God, faithful and true. And with him come his saints. Maybe Enoch got a picture. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly, among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken 
against him. There it is. How many times was ungodly repeated? Four times. Ungodly men, ungodly deeds, ungodly ways, ungodly sinners speaking against God. So Enoch, he's got a walk with God. And he pleases God, so God takes him. He did not experience, he didn't see death. Again, a picture of what we believe for the church to experience a rapture. And maybe we're very close. Are you, are you looking up? Are you keeping your eyes on, on him? Let's go on. Verse 25 in Genesis 5 says, Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. And after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. And he died. Methuselah, what do we know him for? Oldest man to ever live. 969 years old. And you know the little riddle. Travis, should I ask you the riddle? Who is the only one in the Bible who his father outlived him? How does does that go? Oldest oldest person to ever live, but his father outlived him. How, How can that be? Well, Methuselah is the one. Because his father never died. He was taken. Methuselah was alive. If you do the math, and I don't know if any of you are doing math here and trying to figure these things out, Adam was still alive to see Methuselah born. Think about that. So, I mean, he could have been saying to Methuselah when he was a seven-year-old, this is the way it was. We were in the garden, and God created everything. So it's not that far, and it's not that far to Noah. You'll see in a few verses. His name means his his death shall bring. All these names have a meaning. I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. All these names have a meaning. They have a message for us, just like my grandmother had. My great, 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 great grandmother had a message for you. So do these guys. They have a message in their names. Methuselah's name means his death shall bring. His father named him that because he was told told to name him that by God. Here, name him this. Oh, boy, if this kid dies, it's the end. You're going to watch that kid, aren't you? You better put a helmet on when you go skateboarding, Methuselah. You know, that's, that's, that's what's going on. His death shall bring. He died when the flood came. Did he die just before? Was he righteous? I, I don't know. Doesn't tell us. But he's part of the plan. He died when the flood came came this period of time. He's the oldest man to ever live, 969 years. It go, shows God's long-suffering, the, the amount of grace that he had and the amount of patience that he has. He's waiting for people to return to him. God kept him alive longer than anybody to get people as long as possible to repent. Second Peter. Chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. I guess nobody made it one day. From the Lord's perspective, if a day is a thousand years, did Methuselah make it? But it tells us, do not forget this one thing. With the Lord, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That just means he's extremely patient. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. You know, there's too many people that are saying, ah, you know, 
We've heard this before. It's not going to happen, but the Lord is saying, I'm not slack. What I say is going to happen is going to happen. As some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is why Methuselah lived so long, because the Lord is long-suffering and patient. You know? Very patient. I hope nobody's resisting him. Resisting his message that he keeps on giving to you by grace. Because he's just, hey, come on. Come, come to me. Return to me. Return to me. Just remember that, that he's patient. We would like him. I think sometimes we, we get to the point, like, come on. Okay, Lord, come and get us. Judge this world. Take care of business. His heart is going, no, 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 no. I want your sister. I want your brother. I want your sons. I want your daughters. I want your mom, your dad. There's other people that need to come. I want more. I, don't, I will judge because I have to, because I'm a righteous God. I will. But in the meantime, I'm waiting, waiting, waiting for people to return. And so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pray for those people. And we're supposed to be a light and a witness and testify of his goodness. Because he's patient. Methuselah is a great example of God's grace. Simple as that. But let's go on. I need to finish this chapter. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son, and he called his name Noah saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord, had, the Lord had, has cursed. So Lamech, he must have heard from the Lord, hey, Lamech, I want you to name your son Noah. Why do you want to name him Noah? Because he's the one that's going to comfort us concerning our work and toil. It's part of the message. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so we get to Noah. We're going to get into chapter 6 next week about the, the flood, how God instructs Noah. Out of these ten names, eight of them died. One of them did not experience, and Noah has not yet. So, Noah was born only 14 years after the death of Seth, Adam's son. Think about that. And if you total up all these years, you come to, there are 1,656 years from Adam to the flood. 1,656 years from Adam to the flood. Now, <coughs> reading this chapter should have generated a question in your mind. The problem of extremely long lifespans. And I'm sure that that challenges uh, our faith a lot. Oh, there's no way that this ever happened, you know? So they, they come up with all kinds of different things to, to explain it. One of them was, okay, the years are only really months, okay? They're just months. That would mean that Enoch fathered Methuselah when he was five years old. No. Now, I, I have two reasons to believe why they lived long years before the flood. And that was uh, the genetic makeup of man was degenerating slowly. Okay, the genetic makeup. They were more pure. And I think they did use their brains better and more. And they just had a, a, a greater healthy lifestyle, you know, because of the genetics. But we've been under a curse for so long, slowly but surely. And that's one reason. The genetics were pure then. 
and also before the flood, the, you remember that we, we discussed that there was a, a vapor canopy around the, around the earth that was protecting man from all the, you know, destructive rays from the sun. And so that helped them out to live. And it was, the whole world was, expl- you know, Gary just came back from uh, Florida. He's, yeah, yeah, it was, oh, yeah, the weather was good. It was like 80, right? You know, it was nice. And I was thinking about you guys. That's what he said. I was thinking about you guys freezing up there. Well, back in these days with that water canopy, that vapor canopy around the earth, the whole earth was experiencing better weather than Florida, (laughs) you know. During this era, the world would be populated quickly. One writer has estimated that if Adam, during his lifetime, saw only half the children he could have fathered grow up, and if only half of those got married, and if only half of those who got married had children, then even at these conservative rates, Adam would have seen more than a million of his own descendants. Now that's a family reel. He would have seen a million of his own descendants. Wow. And using these calculations, we can say that by the time of the flood, there could have been 7 billion people on the earth. 7 billion. Uh, last I checked, our, our population on the earth was up to 7.6. I think it's probably more than that now. 7.6 billion. Well, with these calculations, we're, they're almost there. There's a lot of people on the earth. As I mentioned, though, like my grand, great, 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 great grandmother had a message for us on her gravestone, and we can read it today and be reminded, this has a message too. This chapter has a great message. Each one of these guys ha- has a name, and their name means something. And if you put them together, you come up with the message. Adam's name means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Kenan, sorrow. Mahalel, the, the blessed God, Jer- Jared come down, Enoch teaching, Methuselah his death shall bring, Lamech the despairing, Noah rest and comfort. So I put that together, yet man is appointed mortal sor- sorrow. That's the fall of man. The blessed God shall come down teaching. God gives us his word. His, his death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. Noah's death? No. Jesus death. Jesus death. There's the message right there. It's fulfilled. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross brings comfort and rest and hope to our souls today. Do you guys all know that? I mean, I need to make sure that you all know. That you believe that Jesus Christ, how how is it that you please God? By faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. And if you don't know him today as your Savior, then let today be the day. Let today be the day. Don't put it off. He is patient, but there will be a day. And you don't know when that day is. What happened in this chapter, and he died. Do you know when that's going to happen? No. So this is the most, most important thing that you could ever do, is believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that he took away your sin. And all you need to do to do that is to call out to him with your own words and say, I'm a sinner, and you're the Savior. You paid for my sins on the cross. I believe that with all my heart. Will God hear your prayer? Absolutely. Is that all? Yes. By faith. 
and begin to walk with him like Enoch walked. Walk with him and have a relationship with him in his word, being instructed every day. That won't save you. The faith will, though. Faith in him. So let me encourage you to do that today. You can do it here in this room. You can come to me afterwards and say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I'd be more than happy to. But you can do it in the comfort of your own home or car or anywhere. But whatever you do, don't hold back. Don't don't wait a moment longer. Last or next week I'll be teaching in Acts chapter twenty six on Friday night, right here. And there's gonna be a man that Paul is testifying to. His name is King Agrippa. And the King Agrippa is going to say, Paul, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Man, that word almost is just a terrible word in terms of eternity. There will be so much regret in that. If you stand, if you pass away and you find yourself apart from God, you'll be thinking of that. I almost. Don't let that happen. Let today be the day of salvation. Let's all stand and we'll, fl- we'll pray. <clears throat> oh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that your word is good. It's good for our soul. And I thank you for people that are hungry to be able to hear what you have to say and what you have written down In your word, Lord, we thank you for your patience, for your long-suffering, for your grace, and we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ today, your Son, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you for that hope that we have today. I pray as we leave your house, Lord, we would not leave you, that you would be with us, we would sense your presence your pleasure, your grace, your shining face. We pray this today in Jesus' name, amen.